Um, yeah, I always drift. Um, recently, to, to stop drifting, I've tended to read talks out because uh, I've done an awful lot. But I talked in Dublin in November about reading out, and so I thought today I would just uh, fly free and, uh, and talk off, um, off the top of my head. Uh, or as some of you will discover, probably out the back of my head. Uh, so I apologize in, uh, in advance for um, any kind of wandering this sort of thing. Uh, that I can. But I've got some slides, and that's, that's the, obviously the self-promotion slide. Um, to give you a bit of background, because although um, I was here in November, that many of you won't know who the, who the hell I am, with uh, good justification. Um, so my name's Nigel Dodd, and I, I've been working on money since um, 1987. Well, uh, and I put this up because this is a this is an album cover of a, a, a band called Cryptic Slaughter, uh, a Californian thrash metal. And I did this for a, I, I put this around for a bit. I, I took it to the Treasury in Whitehall and showed the Treasury this picture, and they, they were uh, really dead from the neck upwards. Tell you, but I'll talk a little bit more about the treasury. So they, they made no impact on them at all. But this, in a song, Money Talks, uh, this was um, thrash metal in, in 1987, and uh, it was very epitomized the, the moment. This was you know, a year after the big bang in, in the city of London, the deregulation of, of uh, the financial system. And uh, some would say ushered in or confirmed it like a neoliberal era as far as finance is concerned um, and led to all sorts of um, nasty things. And the problem for me in 1987 um, was that money was really not the right thing to be looking at if you were a sociologist. And so people tended to assume that I was um, a, a Thatcherite. It didn't help that I was quite young. Um, and so it was a lonely business, I can tell you. Um, Basically, people just people weren't, weren't interested in money. And, and when I said um, to people, uh, this was in Cambridge, so when I said to people, I'm, I'm researching money, you know, they kind of eyes would glaze over. And um, I too find myself in a corner on my own. Um, and, and this continued, and I uh, got my PhD called Money and Social Theory, and I published uh, a book in 94 called uh, Sociology of Money. Uh, there were very few of us um, working on money at that time. There, there was uh, uh, an American sociologist called Vivian Zelitzer, who published in 1994 a book called The Social Life of Money. Um, and in those days, it was pre-internet, really. So I, I, I found Zelitzer by accident in a mouthfeel um, at, the, uh, at a conference on money that the year after, in 1995, I met Viviana. And we, we had dinner together, and it was really like a, a meeting of lost souls. We both commiserated with each other on, on our miserable topics. Um, but she's, she's a superstar now, and, uh, and, and uh, the, social, the social meaning of money, which was her book. Uh, has gone to uh, gone to the heights and is well cited. Uh, another person working on money at the time was Keith Hart, the anthropologist. There, there were a few others, Jeff Ingham at Cambridge, but, but generally we were a very small group. And ever since then, I tried to escape from money. Um, every now and again, I would say, okay, I'm now going to do the sociology of bicycles or something. And I'd be dragged back by some event, like you know, the Euro started. Uh, in in, in uh, 99, and on notes and coins came out in 2002, so that was an interest. And then I tried to run away again um, after the euro seemed to be okay uh, by 2004. There wasn't any big big crisis looming, so it seemed at the time. Uh, so then I tried to escape again, and then and that's the point which Princeton University Press in 2006, seven came to me and said, "Look, can you write us a book about money?" So um, I swore under my breath and thought, well, you, I can't really refuse a, a contract from Princeton, so I may as well get on with it and, and write one. But then I promptly got pneumonia, um, and very badly, and, and that was on my deathbed in, in a London hospital. And uh, they, they were removing uh, part of my right lung when um, Lehman Brothers collapsed. 
um, two events that will forever be associated uh, in my mind. Uh, so I woke up breathless <laughs> with, with uh, and seeing you know the world going to shit around me, and uh, it was rather wonderful. So so uh, that then, but the problem with that event, uh, the financial crisis. So then, so, so I was suddenly working on a, on a hot area, money. And so everyone was saying to me, you know, you're lucky, you sold, you're working on this. But it's not lucky, actually. When, when this thing is happening around you, um, uh, it's very difficult to write a book because events move so fast and publishing grinds slowly. Uh, so I, I was caught. And also, I had this sense I was working on money. Uh, and the crisis wasn't quite about money. It was about finance and banking and, 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 and you know, there, there was a sort of a disconnect going on in my mind about these things and I've been intrigued by, by this ever since. So um, that's sort of my, my story and now uh, of course money, you know, we have meetings like this. Um, I was telling my story recently to a student, um, a PhD student of mine, I, well, a, a potential PhD student, I was advising her on what, what to do for a topic and I was saying, well for God's sake don't do what I did, which is to you know, to get caught up in a topic that then want to escape from, so try to do something that you're happy to be associated for, for the rest of your life. And then she looked at me very, you know, and, and very sweetly said, but money's cool now, so you're fine. And it's true, I mean, but I almost burst into tears. It took 20 years for someone to tell me that I was cool. It's all right for, for the Danish um, Oliver over there, it's just kind of, you know, young and in a, in, a, in a sexy area already, but, but for us old, old farts, it's taken a lot longer than that. And he's right, you know, the what is money question is huge. If you do a Google, uh, this thing where you can look at how, how Google search, the, the question what is money just shot through the roof in 2008, 2009. An awful lot of people were Googling what is money. Um, and as he rightly said this morning, you know, it's kind of not quite the right question be asking, and my, my line on that is, is that we still tend to think of money as a thing, as something that has a, a, a real existence or can be traced back to something real, and I don't think uh, that's uh, correct. Uh, my own take on this, in a, in a nutshell, um, is actually that, that money is a process, and we need to think of it, so not so much as a noun, but as a verb. Money is something you do. And it's a process, it's a series of relations and claims. Um, in the book, I, I use a uh, characterization by uh, George Zimmel, um, a long dead sociologist who wrote a fantastic book in 1907 called The Philosophy of Money. And he, uh, on page 177 of that book, describes money as a claim upon society. Uh, it's a claim that I own, which I can make against any number of people within a payments community. Um, and Zimmel's often cited in conjunction with that description as suggesting that money somehow has to belong to the state. Society, state tends to be the association we still make. And in sociology, indeed, the notion of society tends to have been associated with the nation state for the past hundred years. But in Zimmel's work, it's not. For Zimmel, society is the act of being social. It's, it's a fluid, um, process which doesn't have any necessary spatial fix. It's not fixed to a territory or a community. So I think that now um, that description, you know, the era of Bitcoin and so forth, that description of money as a claim upon the process of being social is probably more prescient than it's ever been and I think it's more flexible. So that's kind of where I'm coming from. Um, now, uh, Something I've been interested in for a while are, are broader changes, and we talked a lot about Bitcoin this morning, and I'm fascinated by what's being said about Bitcoin. I'll have, I'll have something to say about Bitcoin um, in due course, but just as I was beginning to think about the book, I was, I was writing a paper for a journal called Economy Society, and I came up with this distinction, very, very basic distinction, that what I was witnessing then in 2004 when I was writing that paper were two countervailing processes that I felt. On the one side, we had a process of monetary homogenization. The dollar, large currencies, the euro is an example of this. Uh, we are moving more and more towards a kind of placeless money. And I guess this is where people would want to put Bitcoin 
on one level. And on the other hand, we were seeing a, a, a vast amount of diversification of money. Uh, with the emergence of local currencies and time dollars, LEX, RTC, digital monies. Um, and that process of diversification has continued, I think. Um, now, at the time, I was trying to gauge whether or not there might be a connection between these two processes. Whether perhaps the more the pressures for homogenization of money increased, the more there would be pressures underneath for diversification. And you see that, for example, in Greece where quite clearly with the uh, local failure of the euro, uh, you've seen a resurgence of uh, monetary schemes. Uh, not all of which are just a response to the crisis, but what many of which are. You saw it too in Argentina in, in 2001 after that crisis. There was a, a whole spate of, of attempts to reinvent money locally as a consequence of the failure of large scale monetary systems. So that's a context, and that's a sort of a counterpoint, if you like, or a kind of contrapuntal relationship between two monetary processes. That keeps on, I think, defining what we see as money today. So we had a scenario of punning exercise over here this morning, and I was struck by how we were struggling to bridge. You know, on the one hand, we were talking about very large-scale processes. Uh, that seem to have no connection to ordinary people and what they do with their money. And on the other hand, we were talking about you know, the Brixton Pound and, and much more local things. And those things are connected. One of the most remarkable things about money is how those things are connected. But I think we need to think that through um, in, in a fairly smart way. Um, so that's just highlighting like that picture. So, uh, that's why it's there. I have nothing much to say about that other than um, isn't it nice um, now here's here, by contrast here's paul krugman recently um clever chap paul obviously far cleverer than most of us here um saying that he finds money weird he says mainstream macroeconomics acknowledges the weirdness he says in particular it makes heavy reliance on the ability of central banks to create more fiat money at will but otherwise treats money a lot like ordinary goods um, what confuses me is the idea that money is a social contrivance. Uh, so, you know, even one of our brightest macroeconomists, and the Keynesian and anti austerity and all the wonderful things that Cribben represents, still finds it quite difficult to get his head around the nature of money. And that's no surprise, because as we all know, economists have been ignoring money pretty much forever. It's a huge black hole in neoclassical economics. It was quite amusing when I arrived at the LSE. I first got my I, my first job uh, was in Liverpool. I was a lecturer in sociology in Liverpool, and I loved it there. And, and, but then the LSE uh, offered me a job, and I couldn't resist. And I've been not regretting it ever since. But I kind of still, 18 years old, still miss Liverpool, partly because of the different student body and so forth. But I arrived at the LSE, you know, ready, thinking, well, if there's anywhere I can do the sociology of money, it's here. Uh, only to be told very, very quickly uh, that if I dared, dared put on a course, tried to teach a course on money, I would not get tenure. But very clear to me that I wasn't to teach money. This was something the economists did. My response, of course, was, was fear uh, and obedience, um, because we all have to earn a living. Um, but it was also a confusion because I thought, well, the economists don't teach money either. All they teach, and here we come to a part of the talk, all they teach is this origin myth about money starting in a barter system. And you still find the majority of economics courses teach this myth um, that there was once no money um, but this barter system and uh, for ver in various ways this money evolved um, because, to, because BART is inefficient and, and, and so on and so forth. The idea that money originated as a form of payment connected to debt and sacrifice and ritual and all this sort of thing, that's not present at all in economics courses. And, and, and still now, if you look up um, most standard mainstream course in economics, they will not have the debt theory represented Often, and they, some of them still won't actually get to grips with the idea that 97% of the money in circulation, for example, in the UK, is bank-produced money. It's not produced by central banks. It's not 
it's not explicable in, in, in the way that uh, macroeconomics would try to describe it. So this is, this is a huge problem, I think. I mean, if, if economists don't understand or want to teach the nature of money, uh, then we're in big trouble. So you see in, in Britain, um, there's the, the, the post-crash uh, student uh, movement for, for teaching economics in a different way. It's all, all about this. So here's Krugman kind of admitting anyway that, that he doesn't really get money. Uh, but sociologists and social theorists, thinkers, philosophers, all sorts of people have been thinking about the social life of money for a long, long time. And here's just some examples. If I was teaching a very boring course on money right now, I would take you through. Um, most of these are quite recent, but I could have gone way, way back. Something I did in my book, actually, was go try to go beyond um, conventional uh, social monetary theory to bring in some, some different things. Uh, so I was pleased to hear she had really talked about this morning. Uh, but these are just some examples of different ways in which we thought about money. And I am, too, uh, a monetary pluralist. And one of the things that uh, I've been arguing for is that just as we live in, a, in an increasingly diverse era of money, we need an increasingly diverse array of intellectual instruments in order to understand money. There isn't one fiat theory of money that will suffice. And here is where I disagree, for example, with um, otherwise highly esteemed colleagues like Jeff Ingham, who, who does advance the general theory of money. And Jeff and I get on pretty well, but this is one thing on which we'll never agree. For him, it is one theory of money that will suffice. For me, it, 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 it's not a, it won't work like that. Now, at the moment, I'm researching, um, and I'll talk about this in a second, I'm, I'm researching monetary utopianism. And I'm interested in the kinds of ideas that get associated with monies that are being used for social reform in various ways. And one of the things I've been doing is to talk to and interview people that are redesigning money in various ways and ask them, well, what kind of theory of money do you have in your mind? What, what, what do you think about? What, what do you think money is? How do you think it works? And what strikes me is just the, 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 the big array of different conceptions of money that are out there and often associated with the same thing. I'll talk about that in a second, but you find some interesting contradictions as well. So there's a rich repertoire of ideas about money that are current in, in our world. And, and, and I think we should embrace that richness rather than trying to come up with a single theory that summarizes everything. Um, the background is uh, of what I want to say really is about monetary pluralism. It's just, just a, a few pictures of, of different uh, monetary developments that we've got. Here we have uh, a reference to time dollars. Uh, we have, of course, over there, I think either the Brixton, I think that is the Brixton pound on the far right. We have Zoka, which is peer to peer. Uh, we have Bitcoin, which is represented at the middle of the bottom. And over there we have M Pesa. Uh, and of course, there is now Bit Pesa, which I can talk about a bit too. I could have put other things up too. Uh, but what I'm trying to say is that we live in an increasingly diverse monetary ecology. Um, I like that. Uh, I, but. I don't think that diversity uh, is necessarily a good in itself. If you talk to most people uh, who aren't monetary scholars and have no axe to grind, if you talk to most people about monetary diversity, they're not interested. Uh, they don't want necessarily a complex life in which when they go and buy something, they have to decide which currency they use and so on. Uh, they're frightened of monetary diversity. They don't necessarily trust uh, different organizations to produce money. Um, so it's quite interesting then when you sort of say to them, well, hang on, do you, do you have a store card? Do you have like a Sainsbury's Nectar card uh, or a Tesco's Club Points card? Do you use Air Miles? Uh, and they start actually producing out of their wallets uh, evidence that already they, produce, they use actively, without really thinking about it, three or four or five different currencies. The point is they don't really think about it. So th that's an interesting question. But clearly, in the end, we have something which is akin to a private language argument. This is Wittgenstein's old argument. You know, we can't each have our own form of money. You know, it's at a logical conclusion. The logical extension of a completely plural monetary system is that I produce dot coins, and I spend dot coins, and you spend bob coins, or rachel coins 
or bird coins. We each have our own individual kind of money. And actually, there was a form of money called punk money that was exactly this. There was a guy that did money on Twitter. That ain't going to work, I don't think. I mean, maybe you think it will, you know, that each of us has our own separate IOU. So the question we need to ask, I think, maybe this afternoon or at some point, uh, is how far do we want monetary pluralism to go? What's the kind of optimal level? And I think in the end, I mean, when I'm asked questions like, you know, what, what's, uh, how do you judge a monetary innovation? I mean, in, this, in, in a sense, every form of money has a purpose. It's fulfilling a function. And if it doesn't have a purpose, it's not going to work very well. Uh, the interesting thing about our monetary system is that the purpose of the euro, the purpose of the pound, so that, that, that's not really discussed or, or understood. Uh, but, but those monetary forms are, if you like, given to us uh, as entirely neutral instruments. But they all do have a purpose, they have a function. Uh, so one argument to make about monetary diversity is to think about the different purposes of different currencies on different levels. So do we need a world currency? Do we need an international currency? Do we need national currencies? Do we need local currencies? Do we need time-based currencies? What purposes do these things serve? The question then we need to ask is how do they interrelate with each other? Is it desirable to have one big ecosystem in which the different forms of money can talk to each other? Or is a world in which you have lots of forms of money circulating past each other and not really interacting, is that okay too? And again, I'll have something a bit more to say about that in a second. Now, um, I've said all I'm going to say about the origins of money because I, I, the origins of money is interesting because it's a very, very old debate. Uh, and we had some of the debate this morning. But in the book, I go through about seven or eight different ideas about where money came from from the very conventional idea that it came from barter to the very unconventional idea that started in language or even started in violence um, or even started in our poo. That's, that's an argument that we find made by Norman Brown, for example. Um, but I won't go into that in any more detail uh, because we've just eaten. Uh, but generally, uh, what I find uh, about the origins of money is, is a curious question for me is why, why are we so fixated on arguments about the origins of money. Why do we always want to go back to questions of origins? And you see this all of the time in debates. If you, if you listen to the debates between the Germans and the Greeks, for example, about what to do in the Eurozone, you'll find both sides going back to fundamental ancestor stories about where money came from, as if those stories will have a, a, a critical, crucial, and conclusive bearing on the contemporary debate, which I don't think they do. It was Schumpeter, for example, that distinguished between historical and logical origins of Phenomena, uh, and I think he had uh, a good point. So what I'm going to spend the rest of the time talking about is utopianism. Um, and the reason I'm uh, interested in utopianism is partly for this. When I first started uh, researching money and money in social theory, which is the title of my PhD, I got quite depressed because all I found were thinkers like Marx, Weber, Nietzsche, Zimmel, saying largely negative things about money. Money generally was viewed by these thinkers as something akin to a social acid, that something which if you add it to social relations will have a generally corrosive impact. Um, not universally, they also say some good, positive, interesting things about money, but generally it's a negative view. For example, I know well, Zimbel's book, Positive Money, 600 pages, this book, a huge text, has lots of things to say, lots of suggestions, but the general impression you get from reading Zimbel is that the increasing use of money in modern society has had an alienating effect on everybody who lives there. So once you mediate a social relationship with money, you take something away from it. You take out some of its richness. You render it anemic. You take out its meaning. And this generally has been a strong theme in the social analysis of money. Uh, for most of the 20th century. Um, and so I was interested in discovering, and, and you see it played out still in, in books like this, where you find again this idea that money is this acid, that, that it's, it's, we have too much of it, or, 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 or we, we fail to realize we can't buy everything. And even him uh, plays this game too. Although the Pope is interested. Because although he takes this cliched line about money, 
uh, and how we worship it way too much. My own view is that we don't worship it enough, but that's another issue. Um, what's interesting here is actually what he says at the end, the last three lines of this quotation, where it talks about an impersonal economy lacking a truly human purpose. Um, and the notion of a truly human economy is something that he's been advocating ever since he, he started. Um, and the work on this that's been done out of the Vatican is actually being done by a group of sociologists on the human economy and ways of reconceiving the economy, which I think chimes with some of what I want to say. So he's not all bad, this guy. Yeah. Uh, now, you talk, generally, if you look at, you know, I was talking to uh, people at the lunch, if you look at the history of utopia in, in relation to money, uh, most utopia, or, or images of utopia, don't involve money at all. Part of the attraction of the utopia, part of the fascination of the utopia, is that there is no money. Um, and you get all sorts of nice. I mean, Thomas More is my favorite, who says if you get rid of money, you get rid of fraud, fraud theft, burglary, brawls, riots, disputes, rebellion, murder, treason, and black magic, and even poverty itself. Um, Proudhon like money to form a property and so just get rid of it. So the idea generally is that because money is associated with bad things that happen, we need to get rid of it. And I still get a lot of correspondence from people uh, who decide that, you know, that, that they need to tell their philosophy <coughs> to, to an LSE professor. So I get these long, tight letters, you know, the sort of letters you get from mad people, all reinventing society without money. And you see lots of examples of utopian thought that, uh, that are connected with this. Uh, but there's also a different stream of utopian thought, which is actually about reinventing money and renewing money in various ways. So I've become interested in this, but before we move on, I want to be clear about what we mean by utopia. And of course, the, the original Greek meaning of utopia is it's a numb place. It doesn't exist. It doesn't actually, it's only by a mistranslation in English that we tend to associate utopia with a place that we desire. It's actually just a known place. Now, I'm using this term loosely, and I use it simply because people immediately cotton on to what you're getting at, and it, it gets a conversation going. So I'm not uh, making any big play of this. But for me, generally, the, the utopian money is a number of things. First, it's connecting money with the idea of an imagined society of some kind, imagined social order. So somehow, money will help to bring that imagined order into being. That's the main point that I'm making. And my argument is that every form of money has, if you like, a social <laughs> imaginary connected to it. Uh, even those that exist. So the euro, for example, is a great example of a utopian money. One of the main motivations behind the euro was to increase the sense of European integration and European identity. And some of the research that done on the euro in the early stages of these suggested it had indeed increased people's sense of European identity, although that increase in identity was highly class-based, age-based, and gender-based. So in general, men of higher educational uh, attainment were more pro-Euro uh, than women. And generally, the older you were, the less pro-Euro you would be. And, and that ran through uh, discussions of the Euro all the way through. So anyway, that's what I mean by now, the British uh, the museums were, were talked about earlier today, and, and I wanted to put this up. In fact, uh, when I was talking, I added this. This is the, the, the money room in the British Museum. Uh, and there are two sides to it. Uh, and I wanted to show this, because Oliver was saying you know, that there's a sort of obsession with coins in, in museums. And one reason why museums are obsessed with coins should be fairly clear, and it was explained to me by the curators. Coins are things, and you create, when you curate museums, you create things, so they're always looking for objects. And they find debt very, very difficult to represent, above all kind of contemporary forms of debt. Uh, they also find Bitcoin very difficult to represent, but they, they, they do find ways. Uh, but the most interesting thing about this uh, exhibit is the two sides of the room. And the way it's described to me is as follows. On this side of the room, where I'm sitting, Generally, you find all the things that rulers, kings, sovereigns, bishops, and popes have done with money. The rules they've made, the stamps they've put on it, the coins they've minted, the notes they've made, and so on and so forth. On the other side, 
is everything that's happened to money when it's been actually circulating in society. So on the second side, you'll find things like this. The most recent one, I don't know if you saw, I, I should have bought it, I think I've got it with me. The, the Canadian $5 bill, the Spock, I bought one of those on eBay for £12. It shows what a stupid guy I am. Because um, this guy's just sitting in Canada drawing Spock, right, and selling them to people like me. Uh, but the idea of defacing money, writing on it, and so forth. But the other thing they had on this side of the museum uh, are local currencies, time-based currencies, and so on. Now, the museum creators say this, and it's quite radical for, for the curator museum. They say, what money really is in there is on that side, the right-hand side, as you're looking. That's because, in the end, rulers, sovereigns, kings, governments, states can say what they like about what we must do with money. In the end, what money really is, is what we actually do with money. You can only design money so far, and things will happen to it in circulation that you can't anticipate. Uh, and those things can vary. It can be things like defacing currency. There's a tradition, I don't know if you know, but I'm sure you do, of putting political slogans on money. It's a great way of circulating a message. You know, write Obama's dick on a dollar note, and you know, it's going to go around, right? People, it, it, it's a way, it's a sort of, if you like, a a pre-internet way of, of, of something going viral. Um, but defacing currency is a, 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 a very popular too. And, and zealots, uh, the sociologists I mentioned, call this kind of earmarking in a sense. It's, it's sort of marking currency in a particular way. But there are obviously more radical ways of changing the nature of money, and that's to invent money ourselves, to invent our own forms of money. Um, and this is increasingly being done today. Um, so, just to summarise what I've said so far, this is the idea of monetary utopianism. Uh, the assumption is, in various ways, mainstream monies are badly designed, they need a personal freedom to grow a community, and they perpetuate ex financial exclusion. Uh, whereas utopian monies, the kinds of monies I want to talk about now, seek to remedy those flaws, challenge the control of money by states, which makes positive money very interesting, I think, enhance personal freedom, foster local community, and enable financial exclusion. That's basically the story I want to tell. <coughs> and what my current research is doing is basically I'm, I'm collecting schemes. I'm collecting uh, things that people are trying to do, both large and small, uh, with money to try and reinvent it. I'm talking to them, interviewing them, trying to understand how these things work, what works, what doesn't work. There is a strong element of experimentalism in the alternative stroke complementary currency community. So some of you may want to ask me sort of fairly rigid questions about why X won't work or Y won't work. I ask the same sort of questions, being a bit of a money geek, but if you talk to designers of these currencies, most of them are extremely experimental. They'll say, well, you know, we're trying something, like the Brixton Pound is a great example. The Brixton Pound was launched in 2010, I think, uh, pretty much it's gone through two or three different waves where they've had a particular rationale for it and they've tried to promote it in a certain way and they've, they've, they've tried to measure its success in a certain way. That doesn't work, they try something else. That doesn't work, they try something else. I think Bitcoin is similarly experimental. Uh, and I think a lot of the new cryptocurrencies are similar experimental. And that's part of the way in which money should be uh, operating. And again, I think it's another good reason for being suspicious of, uh, if you like, people that are too theoretically uh, rigorous. Now, monetary utopianism has a fairly bad name. Uh, John Kay, uh, writing uh, two years ago now, uh, he was referring to Bitcoin, but he would refer to blocks up, pretty much summarizes. Uh, the idea is, and that is that, that you know, the history is full of, of people who, who suggest that they know how better to organize the currency, and he calls, this, he calls these people uh, monetary cranks, and then says through gritted teeth that Bitcoin attracts anarchists and libertarians. Doesn't play well. I, I don't know if you know, but the, the, the FT has had, you know, has a real thing against Bitcoin has had for some time. I know Isabella Kaminska very well. She, she's the sort of the main Bitcoin person. I've been on panels with her. She, she loathes Bitcoin with, with, with all of her heart and body and soul. Um, but it's great fun debating with her. Um, and then even Keith, Bill Maurer, he's referring actually a friend of mine, a, a 
people should know Bill Maher. Bill Maher is the anthropologist based in uh, California, uh, who does a lot of work on payment systems and has written on Islamic finance and so forth. And then Keith Hart, people surely know all about Keith. I teach a course at the LSE with Keith. After 18 years, I finally got to teach a course at the LSE on money with Keith. Um, and Bill tells this great story uh, where he found some group uh, in one of the meetings he was going to. And he, he wrote to Keith uh, saying, you know, have you heard of these guys, this new kind of group of monetary reformers? And Keith said, well, I've checked them out. He said, they are pretty eclectic American money nutters. Uh, Liberty Dog, the money is <coughs> the funny ideas that haven't gone very far yet. So even Keith refers to monetary utopians in many ways as sort of nutters. And they sort of are nutters, but, but uh, you know, in amongst the, the, the nuttery, if you like, there's a lot of kind of interesting and fascinating ideas and serious ideas, um, which I think are becoming more and more prevalent. And I'm finding, we were talking a little bit about this morning, uh, about this this morning in the scenario planning session, I'm finding more and more people uh, ordinary punters, people not ex non-experts, convinced that something fundamental is changing in the monetary system. They all have their own reasons for this. They, to me, seem far more switched on amongst the audiences I've been talking to, and I've been talking everywhere at, at all sorts of different levels in the last year since the book came out. In the talks I've given in the last year, the least switched on audience so far, and I'm sure I'll get worse, because I'm due to talk to the Bank of England quite soon, was the Treasury. And I spoke to the Treasury uh, six weeks ago, something like that. Uh, and I spoke to them about Bitcoin, and I spoke to them about the Brixton pound, the Bristol pound, time, dollars, spice, all the different forms of money. And it just seemed to have passed them by. There was a lack of comprehension at the centre of government of what these things might mean, what the implications might be. Uh, one question, in fact, the second question I was asked was, what is a blockchain? And this is from the heart of, of, of government. So um, it's kind of depressing. If you talk to economists, if you talk to uh, specialists, often you'll find the same sort of uh, lack of comprehension. But if you talk to uh, people in general, and you talk to uh, people based in fintech, you talk to Bitcoiners, you talk to people that are out of it, then you get a very, very different picture. And I think people on the ground are much more switched on to what's going on, actually, than uh, the Treasury, which, after all, has its own particular view to defend and to pursue. One exception to that might be the Bank of England. The Bank of England published, I don't know if you know Andy Haldane, who's their big uh, economist and their big kind of money guy. He's very bright and uh, very difficult. And uh, under him, they're doing more and more work, which is sort of quasi-sociological. It's more interesting in the, if you like, of the richer aspects of money. And they published a paper very recently. And I think it's partly how they it's behind this shift uh, in the last 18 months where the Bank of England kind of admitted that the theory of money that they've been buying into, which is the market <coughs> theory, was wrong. And actually they admitted that 97% of the world monetary system is, is, is produced by banks. And that, so that was a big sea change. So I think Haldane was responsible for that. Now on page 31 of this research report called the One Research Report, I can send you the report if you want to email me afterwards. On page 31 they discuss cryptocurrency. ECB have done something similar. The Treasury have done something similar. Both the ECB and the Treasury took the line on cryptocurrency that you would expect them to take, which was how can we regulate this? The Treasury's line was, the problem with cryptocurrency is money laundering. So the whole Treasury report, I can send you it too, is all about AML. It's how to stop people using Bitcoin to money launder. Plays into a number of myths around Bitcoin, one of which, incidentally, I think is the ISIS connection, but we can talk about that later. Um, likewise, the ECB, you know, that great, horrendous, big, fat, monstrous, hairy institution came out with a very, very similar idea. Bank of England, their argument about Bitcoin was quite different. Their question was, should we be producing our own? Could there be a Bank of England cryptocurrency? Which I think feeds very nicely into arguments about positive money. But when I wrote to Fran at Positive Money asking her what she thought, wasn't this exciting? I had yet to have a reply. 
applied. So I don't think they've quite worked out what they're going to do with that idea. Anyway, uh, so that's the general thought about money utopians, that they're cranked, that they're nutters, that they're complete um, uh, nut jobs. Now, here's some history. Here's just a few figures of where I found ideas about uh, utopian money going all the way through. Um, I can show you. I discussed these in, in one of the chapters in the book. And generally, this is the sort of thing they're looking for. So, you know, issues that they deal with are inequality, for example, possessiveness or hoarding, injustice, hoarding again, property, the whole issue of the property system, financial exclusion, monetary stagnation, uh, political manipulation, uh, monetary trust, we'll talk about that in a second, and then our, our friend Dutra, uh, uh, who talked about the well, cost of petrol growth, which is also a big argument put forward by now. Now what you'll see here is the sheer range of issues that get associated with monetary reform. So when you talk about monetary reform, you're not talking about one thing, you're talking about a whole multiple. And what I haven't, for example, here mentioned local economic stagnation, the whole issue of the local currency. So there's a whole range of issues that get associated with monetary reform, and it's important to think about them as a range rather than as just one thing. And that's something we can discuss. Anyway, here's a bit more of a complex table that I produced, um, where I look at various sorts of money just represented by that smile and go through uh, what their particular existing monetary system is, their underlying definition of money, their implementation, that how they're going to govern their proposed money, how they're going to create it, and what its utopian aims are. That's all going to be published quite soon. Uh, I can send you links. I can even send you the table. Uh, I, it's probably out of date now. I made this about a year ago. Right, let's now talk about local currency. This is the first candidate on our, on our list. This is the Bristol Pound. Um, uh, you all heard of the Bristol Pound, I assume, I hope. Have you? Or, or is this completely new to you? You have me today. You. New today. And the Brixton Pound. Also new. Is it? Brixton you. Pound. Have you heard of the Brixton Pound? Right. Okay. <coughs> so, um, the Brixton Pound, okay, these are, okay. one of the waves of, of local currency that kind of petered out was Let's, L-E-T-S. And these were the big story in the 1980s and 1990s, and they're pretty much fallen by the wayside. And a, a sort of a new wave of, of local monetary activity came with local currencies. And the first local currency in the UK that was launched, as far as I know, uh, of this ilk was the Brixton Pound, which was launched 2010, I think, or 2009. Um, I'm, I'm associated with Brixton Pound. I, I, I talk to them, I talk at the conferences, I'm on their advisory board. And so, in general, I'm speaking from a stance of someone that supports what they're trying to do. Um, the Bristol Pound is very similar. The Bristol Pound was modelled on the Brixton Pound, but with a couple of crucial differences. And it's, the, the devil is always in the details. The Brixton Pound, first, is fundamentally a form of money that circulates within Brixton. Um, and there are physical notes. Um, the, the best one is the one they call the Ziggy, which is the one that has a picture of a barrel in it, a 10 pound Brixton. Um, if you want to collect money, that's the one to get. It's, it, the value is going to go up. It's going to be on that one, the Ziggy. They're very proud. They're just about to come into their fifth birthday, so it was launched indeed in 2010. I've seen the new Brixton 5 pound note. It is so brilliant. It's beyond brilliant. So follow on Twitter, follow the Brixton Pound on Twitter. It's a stunning piece of design. And it's interesting how we were talking about art at lunch. Design is really crucial uh, to these people. The design of the note really matters. It matters how this looks. And you can see the Bristol Pound, the Banksy references, for example. The Brixton Pound, they have all sorts of, of references. And I, I talked to the guy that designed uh, the Brixton Pound, the guy that's behind the design. And he just you know, tells us one of the stories, like you're in a queue for a coffee, and you know, someone's got their boring old 10 pound note or their 10 euro note. Um, which, you know, let's look at the euro just for a second. Um, you know, it's really depressing uh, as a piece of design. Um, yeah, on the, on, on, well, I'll tell you why it's depressing. Someone asked why it's depressing. Because they have bridges. 
that don't exist. And the reason the bridges don't exist is because they wanted bridges, because they were encouraged by the idea of symbolism. You bridge, you know, bridge in France and Germany. Uh, but actually, when they came to deciding which bridges, the Euro powers went to war and said, well, what about my bridge? What about my bridge? So they invented bridges according to generic architectural styles until a very clever artist in Rotterdam built every single bridge. So if you go to Rotterdam, you'll find these bridges having been built as an art exhibition. <laughs> so these things don't exist. So, so you know, the, 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 the symbolism of the Euro Bridge is that, you know, we're all in it together. But the reality is that we've had to invent bridges uh, in order to disguise the fact that actually we despise each other. Um, and we're not at all in it together. Sorry? Inventing a way forward Well, I guess so. And then, of course, the coins are interesting because the coins do have on one side a national... Uh, and, of course, there are more coins than nations. Because you have the Vatican coin, you have uh, what's the other principality? Is San Marino? They have their own coin. The they are nations. Pardon? They are states. Yeah, they are states, so they have their own design. So um, the euro is interesting. Now, uh, by contrast, the Brixton pound has David Barry. Now, the story behind that was that uh, they realised that Barry has a connection with um, with Brixton, so they wrote to his agents, thinking that he just tell them to sod off. You know, Brixton, I don't want to know. But he said, great. And they, so they sent this design with Barry on it. If you, if you Google it, Barry Brixton Pound, you'll see it. And it's, their, it's their, by far their, their sexiest. No, this guy was telling a story of how you, know, you could be selling in a queue for coffee, and someone's got their boring £10 note, and someone behind has got their Brixton £10 note. And you know, who's the coolest? I mean, it's, it's, and that sort of thing matters in Brixton, believe it or not. You know, you call them superficial, call them Londoners, call them arseholes, call them what you like. But the design really matters. Uh, to them. Um, but there are crucial differences. The, the Brixton pound is ba fully backed. It's a, it's a fully backed sterling reserve currency. So for every Brixton pound in circulation, there is a corresponding sterling pound in a bank account. And they have to do that. That's the regulation. But they're under a light regulation. Uh, if you live in, I don't know, um, you know, Texas, and you apply the Brixton Pound organisers for a pack of money, they won't back that. They'll assume that you're not going to be a risk to the monetary system in Texas. But if you go into a Brixton shop or you apply online for Brixton Pound's real existing Brixton, they, 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 will, they have to deposit sterling in a bank account. That's how, it's, that's how it works. Um, they also, that's one way in which you can use, uh, I'm showing sure Bristol, but. but I'm talking about the Brixton. The Bristol's the same. So if you go to Brixton uh, and you go to the market in, in Brixton, the, the market area, the, the, the roof market, you'll see on various stores, uh, bookstores, butchers, wine stores, so on and so forth, a Brixton pound sign. And if you want to go in and you say, here's 10 pounds, can you take Brixton pounds? You've got your Brixton pounds, and then you spend it. The same in Bristol. The only difference being, you can join the Brixton pound from anywhere. You can do it now. In fact, I challenge one of you, go online, join the Brixton Pound now. In five minutes, you're done. You're there. You're a member of Brixton Pound. You can buy Brixton Pound lottery tickets. I'll explain how they work in a second. Bristol, you can't. Bristol's bigger. Uh, and because it's bigger, it's a whole city. Because it's bigger, it has a different regulatory system. And it's backed by a credit union. So in order to join the Bristol Pound, you have to join the credit union. And in order to join the credit union, you have to have a Bristol address and you have to be credit worthy. So already the Bristol pound, which is partly designed to resist financial exclusion, has attached to it an exclusionary mechanism, i.e. credit rating. So that's the problem that they have to deal with. But the theory behind local currencies is very simple. It's called the local money multiply. This isn't my diagram, I can't do that. Uh, so I stole it from there. Uh, but it's the idea of keeping money circulating locally. Um, so you go and you spend your Brixton pound and the trader can only then re-spend that pound with another local trader, maybe a plumber, maybe a supplier, a cash and carry. Uh, so the idea is that by keeping pound in the community that 
has a benefit on the local economy. The same argument goes with Bristol. Um, the problem here uh, is uh, several fold. Uh, just in case you think I'm a you know, complete money crank and nutter myself. These things don't entirely work. Uh, in Brixton, they have uh, not all that many transactions in the space of a single week. Uh, you might get, for example, on any given day, five transactions in the Brixton pound. Brixton's not a massive area, but it's not a lot of people. If you ask Brixtonians that don't use the Brixton pound, why they don't use the Brixton pound, they tend to tell you uh, that, well, they work in Hobart, they work in Camden, they work somewhere else. Um, why would they want to use a, a local currency? Um, some also say that they associate the Brixton pound with gentrification, that generally the organizers of most of the Brixton pound tend to be white, male, a bit like Bitcoins in some ways. It's not as clear cut as we Bitcoin, but there nevertheless is that issue. So there are problems with it too. Um, the main problem with the Brixton pound, as with the Bristol pound, is incentive. If you're redesigning money, the first thing you should ask is what is that money for? The second thing you should ask is why should anybody use it? Why would you be motivated to use the Brixton pound? Uh, the reason tax matters is because most of us have to pay taxes. And even if we don't have to pay taxes, most of the people we deal with do. So if they're having to pay their taxes in, uh, Randall Ray used an example of beaver pelts, so in, in plastic cups, then plastic cups will pretty much become money. That's the, the argument. So if, if, if there's no incentive to use the, uh, the Bristol Pound or Bristol Pound, it's very difficult to, to get in. Going. So there are lots of ideas about how to do this, because the idea of the local money multiplier, although it's difficult to measure, it's still uh, something which, which matters. For example, one way forward would be to say, I don't know if you've got kids at school, for example, but they have to pay lunch. One uh, solution to this assembly issue would be to say, OK, schools will only accept local currency, so everybody has to invest in it. Uh, it's a very practical way forward that local councils are all that key adopting, but it, it might work. Another solution, of course, is network effects. And I was saying to a group this morning, the big problem in Brixton, ever since the thing started, is what to do about corporations. What happens when McDonald's, or Waitrose, or Tesco's, or BP want to use and accept your currency? They will apply. That's what, how you join the local currency as a trade. You apply to accept the currency. This has happened in Brixton with McDonald's ever since they started the currency. McDonald's has been desperate to get in on this. It ticks their corporate social responsibility box, it makes them look sexy, it brings people in, uh, it's great PR and so on and so forth. Brixton Pound organisers are implacably opposed to this. It presses all the wrong buttons. So it's interesting, from the perspective of a monetary geek like me, joining McDonald's would have great network effects for the Brixton Pound. It would be brilliant more people would use it, it would become more acceptable, and so on and so forth. From their perspective, the Brixton Pound organises, it won't work, it presses all the wrong buttons. Their whole argument is about the local economy and keeping money local, and to just go with a corporation like McDonald's would be a kiss of death. I'm sure they're right and I'm wrong, but it's an interesting debate that's happening. Uh, Bristol has problems from the other direction. If you, if you go to the Bristol Pound website, you'll see a map of who accepts it. And there's a huge cluster in Bristol itself. But I'll tell you for a fact, most of the traders, again, are, tend to be focused and concentrated around, you know, the kind of, if I say, areas where the newspaper that's read is generally the Guardian and, the, and, and, and people shop at Waitrose. That's, you know, or, or what the Labour Party in the UK are now laughing and calling the John Lewis set. That's generally the people that use local currencies in, in, in Bristol. There isn't much of a, uh, a demographic spread, partly because it's a great big problem. But you also find outlying areas. That's where the farmers are, on the outskirts of the city. And farmers generally are very happy 
necessarily when they take Bristol Pound because they can't spend them in their own local communities which are outlying Bristol villages. So there are issues about spatiality. One could argue that money needs to move, that money needs to circulate, that money needs to get outside of Bristol, that by trying to restrict money in this way, restrict the circulation of money, there uh, you're going against some of the fundamental things of how money should operate. Uh, the local currency movement is aware of this. There are other new local currencies coming on stream. There is one being planned in Liverpool. There is one being launched in Exeter in September. There is, in conjunction with this, a local currency guild. And a local currency guild is trying to forge a scheme where you can exchange Bristol pounds for Brixton pounds, for Liverpool pounds, for Exeter pounds. So local currencies are local, but you can use them in different cities. But the problem still exists of incentive. Why would you be persuaded to use one of these things? In Brixton, they've decided to forget all the rational argument. So the third wave of the Brixton pound started on April Fool's Day this year. I don't know if you saw it on Twitter, when they announced that they would start using John Major as their new Z. Uh, because he was a, he was a Brixton Boy, and they felt that, uh, and the argument they used was that white males were underrepresented uh, in, in Brixton literature. You can imagine the apoplexy that occurred in the Twitter sphere uh, with people that failed to recognise it was April the first, and they were actually um, having a joke. Um, but they are relaunching now with their new five five pound, which will come out in the next few weeks. As I say, it's wonderful. Now, the the, the, the key to the relaunch is to start simply saying. You know, it, it's an identity currency. So the arguments about the local money multiplier and so on and so forth, they're saying, well, they're fine, but what the Brixton Pound really is about is about an enriched social experience. If you use the Brixton Pound in Brixton, you're going to have a better time. You're going to enjoy using money more. You're going to signal to the person you're buying stuff of that you have a certain commitment to the local economy, that you belong in some ways. Now, it might seem like pie in the sky, but for reasons I'll describe in a second, these things matter, and they increasingly matter. The kind of experience we have when we use money is something that even the corporations are waking up to. But here's a summary of the kinds of issues that you get between Bristol and Brixton Pound, and some of the issues. Uh, so although they're the same kind of thing, I think they're going in different directions. The other issue between them is how much local council involvement should there be? Brixton has been associated with the Lambeth Council from the very beginning, but that association is now beginning to stop. Bristol is still associated with local council. But as an issue in Bristol, for example, local taxes can be paid in the Bristol pound. In Brixton, Lambeth, local, uh, local uh, government employees can have 10% of their salary paid in the Brixton pound. So local government has a benefit uh, to, uh, for local currencies, but not necessarily. And I, I, and I think what we'll see is the Brixton pound uh, moving further away from the local government. Moving on, incentive is the issue I pulled out. By the way, incentive, if you think about the incentive to use Bitcoin, what was the early incentive to use Bitcoin? It was drugs. Now, the Bitcoin had the best game in town for a while. I mean, if you wanted to get stoned and high and not arrested, get Bitcoin. Uh, it's a great selling point. They're very aware of that in Brixton and very tempted, I'm sure, to feed some of those Brixton pounds into the local drug trade. And I got that from the guy that runs the thing, so it's not just me talking. <laughs> anyway, to incentive. Time-based currencies are different uh, in a number of ways. A time-based currency isn't backed by sterling. It's not denominated in sterling. A time-based currency is an hour. One hour. And I have some in my pocket uh, because, uh, simply because I failed to take them out. But I can show you some uh, circular of these if you wish. Uh, now this is, um, oh, I've got loads. I've got about, there they are. Um, this is from, uh, if you want to have a look, uh, an organization that operates um, in, in, uh, in London, um, but also elsewhere, called Spice. And um, the idea of uh, Spice, 
you've got any real money there, then uh, you may as well keep it. But, um, the idea of spice is, is, is as follows. Um, it's backed partly by Nesta, which is a big think tank uh, based in, in East London. Um, the idea of spice is that if uh, a local government, generally, or a local community organization, um, has problems getting volunteers, so libraries, schools, hospitals, prisons, uh, local care homes that need volunteers to work for them. They have problem attracting volunteers for various reasons. The idea of this currency that you're now looking at is that you can go and volunteer an hour of your time and you'll get back one of these for one hour. And you can spend these in various outlets. And for these you'll get services. You won't get goods. You can't go and spend these in McDonald's or Sainsbury's or Waitrose or the cash and carry, or the hardware store. But you can spend them in the Tower of London, you can spend them in climbing centres, you can spend them on education lessons, music lessons, uh, you can get philosophy courses. Uh, there's a whole booklet that will be uh, given to you where you can spend your time um, currency. This operates in London, Wales, South East, South West, North East, and the East of England at the moment. Um, the crucial edge that they've got is that if you earn one hour in London, you can spend it in Wales or in Bristol or wherever else. So there is uh, an ability to transfer between one hour and another. Uh, so it gives you quite a lot of mobility. Um, so far, this is working. Uh, it, they're very careful about how to launch it. You have to apply to SPICE, the organization. If you want to do this, you have to apply, and they will come, they'll do a feasibility study, they're extremely professional. Uh, uh, but this, so far, has been extraordinarily successful. A number of things it does. First, the incentive issue is there, because time hasn't been monetized. It's non-existing monetary form. You're creating money uh, or nothing. That's the first thing. The second thing is you've got transferability. So although each currency has its own area, you can go from one area to the next. So I think SPICE, as it's called, uh, has a lot of legs. Another version of it is ECHO. Now the difference between SPICE and ECHO is that ECHO is business to business. This is businesses exchanging time. Uh, I haven't looked deeply into ECHO yet, but the day after tomorrow I'm interviewing the guy that runs it. But that also operates out of London. Echo and Spice at the moment don't compete because one operates in the business sector, one operates uh, in the voluntary sector. But competition, I think, is likely down the line. So that's uh, a new one. And then the other one I wanted to mention is peer-to-peer -peer lending, which is uh, what this represents. And that's another version of uh, uh, financial and monetary innovation, which I think is interesting and exciting. What I'm interested in, one of people I'm talking to are from Zopa, which has grown hugely in the last couple of years. They now lend, uh, I think they've lent well over a billion pounds sterling in the last couple of years alone. So, uh, and the idea of peer-to-peer -peer lending uh, is from both the perspective of borrowers and savers, that uh, in one sense, what you're doing is taking the black box of the lending relationship. You know, you're actually able to have more contact with uh, what happens to your money <coughs> when you save it, or uh, what it is you're doing when you're borrowing it. Also, that they actually offer very competitive rates. Uh, there are issues with, with SOPA, of course. Uh, none of these things is perfect. And then a favorite of mine. Now, I talked about enriching the monetary transaction. And this is an artist called Heidi Hinder, who had a wonderful exhibition at the Victoria and Albert Museum in London. And she came up with this idea of hug and pay. And the idea that she said was that, you know, money is this cold thing. She, she picked up the arguments from people like Zinn and said, money is this cold thing, this cold, uh, anonymous, uh, increasingly immaterial, you know, because we just wave and put, we just flash our Oyster card or our bank card. And increasingly, we don't even put it into a chicken pin machine, we just wave it. And it's done. And that's a kind of uh, 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 something which she regrets. So she said, you know, how about the opposite to this would be, and this is an artist like a hug and pay. So you actually, you know, you, you have some something on, like an electronic device here, and basically if you hug someone, that's the 
get more automatically the money. Uh, and what she's getting into there is the idea of money and contact. Money electronic contact, money and human contact. And she invented, she, she thought well, she, there could be a tap and pay. You could sort of do a tap dance uh, in order to pay. And, and yeah, I've been talking about this for quite a while. And when I talk about this, people look at me and they just go, OK, he's lost the plot. You know, no wonder the LSE didn't want him to teach uh, money. Uh, and that's fine until, of course, McDonald's took up the idea on Valentine's Day, 2015. If you went into a McDonald's and you were lucky, instead of paying for your Big Mac, you could just give somebody a hug or take a selfie. So Heidi, when she's, I mean, I, 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 Heidi always tweets me after I've given these talks because she sees that I, I still use her stuff and she loves it, she loves the PR. But when she saw McDonald's, she got quite nervous because she's like, well, she's actually invented something quite useful. This is all about, if you like, a classic capitalist neoliberal fantasy about making everything a bit more curry and warm. And something very similar in prep. They had this idea recently that you get a random free cookie when you went. So if you go into prep, the staff in prep are authorised to give a certain number of free coffees every day. So you go through the door and someone comes up to you and says, I like your face, have this food. So actually, it's great if it happens to you, but of course if it doesn't, you feel shit. You assume that there's something wrong with you. Um, now what's interesting are both are forms of utopian money, if you like. They're both about enriching the transactional relationship. Here, instead of giving McDonald's money, you give someone a hug or you have fun. Here, you get something for free. But what's missing in both of these utopian images? Money itself. They replicate the fantasy that the only way to improve the economic relationship is to rid it of money. Whereas my Heidi doesn't. She incorporates a couple into money because money, the payments mechanism, involves giving somebody a heart. What about Box, the artist? Box is another fascinating yeah. one where he painted his own mm. forms of money and in fact was that they tried to arrest him on some occasions yeah, yeah. for, for mm. fraud. Uh, but that was a fascinating example of, of, of you know, testing what money is um, by, by its representation. So that's great examples of, of what we're doing. And in a sense, we go back to this old distinction, which some of you uh, here will know about, a guy called Polanyi, uh, much cited by anthropologists, who talked about general purpose money and special purpose money. And this is often used, this distinction, to criticize things like the Brixton Pound, because the argument is that where proper money is general purpose, proper money can be used anywhere and by anyone. Whereas things like the Brixton Pound and so on are really just uh, special purpose. They're limited money. Now, the, the impression you get from this is they're sort of emaciated money. They're money that has anorexia. They're money that's sort of been diminished in some way. Whereas I would argue, from my experience in Brixton, that actually these forms of money are enhanced money because they bring with it a much richer social relationship. And if you don't believe me, just spend half a day using a local currency. Go into a city get some currency, go around and use it, and you'll see that you're engaged in far more interesting conversations. You may want to dismiss that, but McDonald's don't dismiss it, so I think neither should you. Bitcoin. Just want to spend, spend a little bit of time talking about Bitcoin. I talk about Bitcoin a lot, and I talk to Bitcoiners a lot, and I've been asked more questions about Bitcoin than just about anything ever in my entire life. Part of me hates Bitcoin, part of me loves Bitcoin. <coughs> uh, most of the people I talk about who are supporters of Bitcoin are definitely certifiably mad. My favorite uh, recently was a Canadian who trades Bitcoin and spends all of his day trading Bitcoin. I spoke to him <coughs> eight weeks ago when bit one Bitcoin was worth $231. He'd just been scammed um, by selling Bitcoin to somebody and he misunderstood that they were leaving him a check rather than uh, some sort of debit card and the transaction was screwed. So he lost about a thousand pounds or dollars worth of Bitcoin. But he was still a great supporter. He had half of his net wealth in Bitcoin. He told me that he likened Bitcoin to gold. In fact, I was tweeting an article that was in Wired just now 
where they call Bitcoin gold 2.0. We talked about that a little bit this morning, so I won't go on about it. Um, he introduced himself to me as a libertarian. So I was intrigued by what he thought Bitcoin really was, and I pointed out various things. So this was a Skype um, And uh, he told me that uh, money was like language. Okay, I've already introduced the analogy today. And that what exciting about Bitcoin was that it was a possibility that we could end up in a world with only one language. We all speak the same language. It's a universal thing. I was horrified by this. And I said, do you mean like Esperanto? And he said, yes. <laughs> I know he's an alien, but really. Uh, uh, and I said, I thought you were a libertarian. This, oh, you will love this. I said, I thought you were a libertarian. He said, yes, I am a libertarian. I said, I thought libertarians were against monopolies. He said, no, no, no. We're only against state monopolies. <laughs> Isn't that sweet? So, but you know, serious Bitcoin. He reckoned he would be that he, he would be one of the richest five Bitcoins uh, quite soon. So he's got a lot of got a lot of money stashed up in Bitcoin, um, and he's very active and, and, uh, and very interesting. Now, on money, I was intrigued by his theory of money, and I put it to him uh, that actually Bitcoin was nothing like gold. I put it to him that the 21 million is a figure that was invented and could be uninvented at any time. All they needed to do was have a vote, and the chief designer would simply flip the switch and they could, they could double it. Now, for some people, that would actually be a great thing. You know, if Bitcoin could be a bit more elastic, a bit more Keynesian, then it would actually be a much less a dangerous thing, because a world consisting of Bitcoin would be high as inflation. Interestingly, he wasn't bothered by this. He saw no problem. He said, I know that's the case. I know exactly how Bitcoin works. I know that at any point they can change the number. But, and Ollie would enjoy this, 21 million is a highly symbolic number. It's become the number into which Bitcoin is embedded. It's become, if you like, its underlying balance, its underlying balance. So the belief that Bitcoin will only ever get to 21 million. It's what keeps the network going. And the chief designer understands all that. Now, if that doesn't sound to you like a classic social constructionist explanation of how a central bank operates, then I don't know what does. My point being that Bitcoin, very interestingly, has come to replicate the mainstream financial system more than anything. Uh, that I can possibly envision. In fact, it's gone beyond the mainstream. You talk in the mainstream financial system of a 1%, for example. In the Bitcoin world, it's 0.01%. The concentration of wealth in Bitcoin is extreme. The Binkle Ross twins have just about all of it. Um, it's absolutely frightening. So, Bitcoin um, doesn't look good in that sense. Nevertheless, it's utopian. Uh, People are attracted to it, so they tell me, because the idea is free of the state. I think this is really important to the Bitcoin community. They're, they're buying into the sort of anti-state rhetoric that came out of two key events. The first key event is the one that we'll expect, 2008 crisis. The general perception amongst Bitcoin of the crisis is that the state bailed out banks. The state cannot in their view be trusted. So it doesn't matter what positive money is saying. It's an interesting one. They're anti-banking, of course. So they're, they're attracted by Bitcoin because of dual disintermediation. It takes the banks out of the money, it takes the states out of the money. They also believe that Bitcoin will be inflation-free uh, because of the 21 million. They're attracted to the idea of trust-free money. This was in Nakamoto's original paper. We talked about it this morning. Um, it doesn't work, but nevertheless, it's there. The idea that you, that, that, that you don't have to trust human beings to run the guns and you can just delegate everything to machines. And the idea of debt-free, we talked about this one. So that's basically what you told me. But underneath it all is the gold fantasy, which I've represented with this, taken straight off Tumblr, as all best gifts are. You know, the idea underneath it all is that really this is a 
kind of gold we not um, But nevertheless, despite all of this reactionary stuff, I mean, if you talk to a Bitcoin app and you point out that the theory of money underlying their allegiance to Bitcoin is much closer to the German and the Greek representation of the Euro crisis, for example, a lot of them are very pleased. Uh, because there is in Bitcoin a genuine anarchist streak, uh, a commitment to horizontalism, uh, which you find in work by Graeber, and you find it, that Paul Mason talks about it, you find it in PTP. Uh, there's a commitment to a distributed form of sovereignty or authority uh, that is quite heartfelt and genuine. So, what I want to say about Bitcoin is that the community is actually quite diverse. And you get the reactionists, you get the Winkle bosses, you get the guys that want to go down the Silicon Valley trip, but you also get the radicals, you get the ones who are much more interested in money as a kind of anarchist utopia. And I think it's important to understand the full range of political sentiment underpinning Bitcoin. We've talked about this a little bit. You know, the problem with Bitcoin is that the mass mean that there is a built-in tendency, there's like a power law the Bitcoin software that favours large producers. And again, this is a worrying thing in relation to mainstream currency. So there's an underlying automatic tendency for larger producers to be rewarded. Um, so there's an incentive to out-process everybody else. So nowadays, if you want to mine for Bitcoin, you can only really join a pool. Uh, and these are large pools that dominate everything. And this is just something I'm taking from January. You can find the latest version of this to the coin desk. Uh, these are the very cool ones. I only include them because I love them being described as idiot dick twins. I think it's funny. Uh, if you've seen the Facebook movie, these are the guys, they did the two rollers you know, that, that had this thing with Zuckerman, and now they're into Bitcoin. Horrible. The gender thing is, a, of course, a crucial issue. We know that uh, Bitcoiners generally are white and they're male and they're young and um, quite. Um, are pleasant, many of them, although I've also met some ones I'd quite like to hug and pay. Um, this was an article um, by Isabella, published just uh, earlier this month, um, worth checking in the Financial Times if you can get through the paywall, otherwise I'm quite happy to cut, cut and paste it for you. Uh, she was going to why um, women generally don't get involved with Bitcoin. What I found interesting and revealing, and possibly made her case even better than she'd made it herself, was how much grief she got for writing this, how much grief there was on Twitter uh, from Bitcoin. So they don't like being called out. <coughs> but this raises wider issues about women in tech. I think are interesting. I wanted to mention BitPazer because I had great hopes of BitPazer. BitPazer is the idea of using the M-Pazer system which is the idea in, in, in uh, countries uh, where there is a high level of unbanked people, places like Kenya. Bit, uh, M-Pesa is where you pay by phone. You, it came out of, uh, has any people heard of it? It came out of transferring money using phone cards. Uh, because general, Western General and all these uh, uh, banks and, uh, charged an awful lot of transaction fees. So M-Pazer came in, it was pushed hard by the Gates Foundation. BitPazer is a version of this which cuts transaction fees. So if you want to transfer $10 using Western Transfer, you'll be charged something like 20% transaction fee, which is a lot. You want to pay by M-Pazer, that goes down to about 12%. If you want to pay by BitPazer, it goes down to about 7%. So I thought BitPazer, yay, this is the way to go, until I sat and a presentation given by the person who runs BitPazer. And it turns out that this is not at all uh, a kind of utopian scheme at all. She's basically an ex-foreign exchange trader. And this is just a big foreign exchange operation for her. It will only ever happen where A, uh, there are, there's no competition, and B, she can find local people who are prepared to act as counterparties. So I'm not that keen on BitPazer, but I'm meeting someone later this week to talk, talk it through. Is it, is it not going to be as cheap as M-Pesa then? It's going to be cheaper, but only in certain countries. And it, 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 it could easily go wrong. Uh, and, and I think she's exposing. She wasn't very pleasant to listen to or to talk to, the person who's running it. And she, she basically, funnily enough, the chair, the chair of the session, Mrs. Vela Kaminska, who I just 
uh, shown writing about gender. And Isabella Kaminska kept asking her about the count. She said, well, basically it's an FX transaction. So people, you want to send money to somebody in, in Kenya, you buy Bitcoin. And then Bitcoin gets transferred and they get, it gets re-exchanged on the other end. So you need an FX transaction at either end. So Isabella kept asking this woman, I've forgotten her name, who's the counterpart to the other end? And she said, we have them. And Isabella was saying, hang on, it's got it's local people, right? So these are the very unbanked that you're, you're screwing somebody because you know you're making your margin is what your incentive would be involved in this. And she, she basically kept pretending she didn't understand the question. So I, I think I, I'm, I'm less keen on, on <coughs> this data. Finally, uh, because you'll be wanting me to shut up, the blockchain, this is what's happening. You've got, bit, you've got blockchain with money, which is basically Bitcoin and Ripple. The new thing, the big story now, is the blockchain without money. And that's Eris and Ethereum. The big story, you heard it from me, is Eris. And Eris is a version of the blockchain which has one crucial difference from every other version I've seen so far. I've met the people that have designed Eris. The big difference is that Eris is not a single blockchain, first. Or if Bitcoin is, Ethereum is, Ripple is. Second, it has no money. And interestingly, the argument from Eris is that the monetary incentive in Bitcoin is inherently centralizing, which is an interesting one that Rachel discussed. So the reason Bitcoin ends up being centralizing is because you produce coin. But the argument about that has always been that you need coins in order to keep the blockchain running. Why would anyone participate in a blockchain without coins? Eris's answer is if you make the blockchain useful enough, of course they will. But their blockchain is open source software and generally it's been taken up by banks and defense companies. I don't know what defense companies are doing with it, but banks are using it to set up real time gross payment settlement systems. Uh, and, and, and it's people like Barclays are already in. So if the blockchain is going to influence the future of money, it will be in these two areas. It will be in relation to Bitcoin or something like Bitcoin. But it will also be in relation to the use of blockchain technology in the financial system, not associated with currency. And it's crucial. Does it just have to be the financial system? I mean, no, it's the fancy registration. Yeah, like could, could be it. smart contracts, yeah. lawyers, well, probably lawyers if they're smart, because otherwise they're going to be out of business. The big story here is smart contracts. At the moment, it's banks <coughs> and uh, military, for various reasons. Gates Foundation are also interested in blockchain technology. They're not interested in Bitcoin. They're interested in this, in areas. And, but Gates are interested in it because for them, things like property transfers, where fertilizer goes, all the stuff about where their money goes in the areas that they're being philanthropic, blockchain gives them a much better handle on that than relying on what they regard as corrupt local so this sort of trust-free side of the blockchain has an interesting impact. But that's where the big story is at the moment. The, the guy I uh, talked to from Eris is their CEO, Preston Byrne, who's worth following on Twitter, and it's worth looking at uh, all of They even argue that, that, that uh, blockchain can be used for regulation. Right? So they're even trying to sell their ideas to the Treasury and so forth. So it's a fascinating story. I wanted to mention positive money because I talk to these guys a lot and I'm interested in their ideas. The big ambiguity here, we talked about it this morning, positive money so far used the term monopoly to describe the form of money that they envisage. And uh, Ole kind of used it today. You both said you want pluralism, but also that it has a big debate that positive money needs to have is can their proposals coexist with a system where you also have Brixton pounds, Bristol pounds, time-based currencies, but also maybe derivatives and other forms of debt instrument. If you ask positive money to answer this question, you won't get a clear answer because it's a difficult one. Uh, so the big issue for me with positive money, I'm very supportive of positive money. The thing I like most about positive money is that they're encouraging this broader conversation about how money where it comes from, where it goes. 
how it, how it serves power and so forth. But there is this issue of how it actually operates. But I'm worried about the idea, and I'm maybe just too old, but I'm worried about the idea that you could have a central monetary policy committee making decisions about where money should go in the economy. That, to me, is going back rather than forward. My own view is that money should be invested you know, close to the ground. Banks aren't necessarily the right way of doing that as they can't be configured, but I think there's a world of difference between Barclays and a local bank of some sort. So I think there are people, specialists in the area, generally don't support positive money. Even Steve Keane doesn't support positive money's proposals in detail. Uh, he proposes something else. The specialists I talk to, including advocates of monetary and monetary theory, for example, where you expect them to agree with positive money, they generally argue that there should be changes in the regulation of the banking system. It's a debate, and I'm open to have a conversation about this, because I like positive money and support them, and I signed up the queue to the people, uh, which you mentioned. I signed the FT letter that was published uh, recently, where they, where they said, you know, rather than the sort of ECB just giving money to the financial system, they should put money on the ground. It reminds me of Keynes' great uh, argument about very profits and so forth. Um, just before we finish, the big issue, and I've probably gone on for far too long, I wanted to show you this. This is descriptions that I found in the, in the literature, the serious financial press to describe quantitative easing. Uh, I found it fascinating. And it reminded me of how we're not meant to think about money. And it reminded me of being told back in 1996 at the LSE that I shouldn't worry my then quite pretty little head about money. Um, it was, had nothing to do with sociology. Equally now, it's not really something we're encouraged to do. Why I like positive money is that it is encouraging everybody to have a conversation about money. What I like about the Bristol pound and the Brixton pound is equally that it's encouraging people at a local level to think about where their money goes. What I like about PTP is equally that it's showing people that there is a debt relationship that doesn't simply involve a computer rating you, it actually involves your money going in two real places. So all of these descriptions of Q, to me, are going in the wrong direction. This is the kind of language that gets trawled out to tell us that things are far too complex for us to understand. And one of the books that's been published recently to popularize money by John Manchester, no less. Many of you probably have this. I bet you more of you have this than mine. He too describes quantitative easing as magic money. He calls it the, let me see, he says it's the, uh, the creation of magic money elves. Now, let me just imagine for a second that you've invited me here today from the LSE to discuss quantitative easing. And I've stood up after lunch and started by saying quantitative easing is the invention of magic money elves. I think you would have asked me to politely go back to the airport and piss off back to London. But this is what Manchester gets away with. Just in case you think this was a blip in his book, he uses the word magic 43 times in a book <laughs> entitled How to Speak Money. So I think he needs to change the title of this book to How to Speak Bullshit. Right? <laughs> <laughs> uh, even though I think it's a great book and I think he's a wonderful man, but I think uh, using the word magic in relation to money is very helpful. This is my favourite slide because I think this summarises what I've been trying to say. That in the end, money is worth uh, the social value that we put upon it and the social relationships that we have around it. I've gone on for far too long, I apologise for that, but that's it, that's my thing, that's my money to the script. Thank you very much for listening. <laughs>
I'm fine with the community, but let's say that there is money is a claim upon society, yeah. and you may say that it's a claim about, uh, on a specific community. Yeah. Yeah. Brixton is yeah. fine. Yeah. But then when I try to use this to uh, explain Bitcoin, it doesn't make sense to me. So that's why I'm interested in Bitcoin. Why not? What is the association or the society Bitcoin. upon which I'm making a claim? Bitcoin. Bitcoin. I mean, the, the point now is with electronic currency, the society, this is why I say Zimmerman is so useful because you've got the situated society. Bitcoiners are, are you are, you're a member of the Bitcoin society, seen by virtue of the fact that you're The person that has Bitcoin, that, that, that two of you said today this morning that you, you, you had bought Bitcoin, uh, you become a member of that kind of community. If I put on my website, as Brett Scott does, that I would accept Bitcoin in payment for my book, I join the Bitcoin community. By taking or using a currency, you join the community of people. Uh, and it doesn't have to be any more specific than that. The, you know, the, the questions of identity are interesting around money. Uh, and Bitcoin has had more to say about identity than you imagine. A very strong association with Bitcoin as a form of identity. But there's no, there's no problem between talking about Bitcoin as a society or the euro. Or, or, or the pound, or the Brixton pound, or, or anything else. It's, it's a, no, I would say that my interest there is what kind of association does it show that we don't have, we didn't oh, have before. Right. Because, for example, being right. trustless then yeah. doesn't resonate with community the no, way I have it in mind. Right. First, it's not trustless. That's complete bullshit, and most Bitcoiners admit mm -hmm. this. Second, this mad guy I spoke to, really got in touch with me. Is he have a question? He said, "You're talking about the social life." And I've got a suggestion that, that in Bitcoin there is, uh, this is, I meant to say this, I'm glad you've asked this question. Bitcoin is an incredibly inefficient payment system, right? It takes 10 minutes for the blockchain to move itself. And for payments professionals, that's horrendous. They're talking about this and this payment these days. But during this 10 minutes, what does this guy do? So he, he has a transaction with someone on the other side of the world, or the other side of Montreal, wherever it might be. He has a transaction, and they have to sit waiting for 10 minutes for the blockchain. To go through. That's what they do. And apparently, that's how you do it. So he tells me. In that 10 minutes, he goes on Skype and he talks to his fellow transactor every single time. And I say, What do you talk about? And he said, We talk about money, we talk about Bitcoin, we talk about why we're involved in Bitcoin, we get excited about Bitcoin. Um, and I said, yeah, always? He said, yeah, always. Yeah, everybody. So, so there is this intense moment. So just as Heidi Hinder hugs people to pay, and people in Brixton talk about their commitment to the community, there is still, in, in Bitcoin, a richer social relationship involved in the transaction of money, even though it's robot money, even though it's machine money, involves strong association. And of course, trust, because we heard we can make docs, and we also heard that the guy that we get what got scammed. Of course, money always involves trust. The idea that it doesn't is kind of a nonsense. I mean, nothing much of it is bonkers on that point. But I think there are strong, you know, of all the people I've met involved with Bitcoin, the one community involved with money, the one community where you find the biggest level of commitment to the community is Bitcoin. And there's no mystery about that. It's new. Any early adopter, you go out on an Apple store when the new iPhone comes out, everyone's really enthusiastic. But that's Bitcoin. There's a lots of enthusiasm around the country, lots of commitment, and lots of talk. You go online, you see Bitcoin being talked about on forums all the time. They talk, they meet, they talk to each other, they have balloons, flags, you know, it's really a big uh, <coughs> thing. Uh, so there's a lot of capital involved in Bitcoin, but there's also a lot of social capital. Genuinely embedded in this thing. But there's also a culture there, because you there mentioned is. the libertarian synapses, yeah. and you think about you know, the, the, Very the, those people in, in the Western United States, for example, you know, thinking about coming I mean, revolution. I yes. Mean, the Federal Reserve is yeah. uh, an instrument of the devil, and that sort of thing. It does kind of fit. Yeah, it completely fits, and there's a very strong political uh, line. Mm -hmm. And it's interesting, you see the divisions, of course, you know, the Winkle bosses wouldn't talk to, to, to my man necessarily. Uh, but they all have their spheres of exchange, and there's a very strong social element if you talk to, to, to Bitcoin. And so it's, it's, to me, it confirms more than anything else. The one, you know, the Bitcoin's curious because you think it was machine money, you think it was robot money, you think if anything proved that money has no social life, it'll be Bitcoin. But if you actually talk to Bitcoin, you watch, you use it, 
you know, you see how it works. It's absolute confirmation that the money is inherently social. You had a question? Yeah, you were talking to give an example of the different blockchain technology, like Ethereum, yeah. and is. Yeah. I don't understand why the bank companies and banking system would like to build on the blockchain technology and to use it for their own use. Yeah. Ethereum, in my view, but from my understanding, it's more for social good. It's about yeah. this one platform yeah, yeah. people trying to build different kind of applications. Yeah. To make. So, like, uh, can you talk to uh, yeah, like Ethereum and the yeah, Right, the way I understand it is exactly as you described. Ethereum has this big ambition to be the blockchain. So it's a blockchain singular. Uh, and they took a lot of venture capital. They issued Ether. Uh, I think I've given a figure, uh, but I, I can't remember what it is, but they got a lot of money. Most of that money has now been spent. Um, while Vitalik and his fellow mm -hmm. had something, and there is no Ethereum yet. It's not, it's not right yet. It doesn't exist yet. It's still, and then still, there's like we're still waiting and waiting and possibly waiting. So there's a problem there. The problem is several fold. One is ambition, they're way too ambitious. The idea that there could be one single blockchain. The other is that they are committed to this distributed ledger ideal. Now, for me as a utopian, I think I'd go with Ethereum as the most interesting uh, idea of utopia. But it's, it is utopian in that none place sense, one could argue that it, I, I wonder whether it would ever actually come on stream. Um, it's, I don't know why the delay is happening, but it's not there yet. The other problem is that the Eris is arguing this different. Eris, they're saying, look, the idea of. Go back to the magic thing. I, I, I went to a presentation with, with, with Vitalik from Ethereum and Preston Byrne from Eris. And I was you know, completely open to reset. The very first slide, so Vitalik is a really smart guy, and you've seen him uh, just looking up on the Super, super smart, weird and smart, uh, like most people involved in this world. His first, so he, he started by saying, okay, so what is a blockchain? And he puts out a slide that said, the blockchain is a magic computer. Oh. And I thought, oh, magic again, right? So then he went on, and it was very much, you know, you, you're an audience of non-specialists, even though there were some real geeks in there. Um, but it's this, uh, so it's this very ambitious, very hazy, very vague. Then Preston came up, and his very first slide, and it was completely a coincidence, was there is nothing magic about the mm -hmm. They're totally different philosophies. So around Ethereum, and you'll see if you watch their videos and you read their literature, around Ethereum there is a sort of myst mysticization of the blockchain. There's this big solution to everything. You know, uh, do you want to prove that you exist? Put yourself on the blockchain. You know, do, do you want to prove this? Put it on the blockchain. It's this idea that you can have a perfect memory. The, the area slide is the blockchain is just a database. That's all it is. It's a fancy database. It's a rolling Excel spreadsheet. The blockchain is like one row of an Excel spreadsheet, and every 10 minutes it gets renewed. And on that, you can record stuff. But it's not useful for everything. First point. Second point, it's not always useful if you have it decentralized at all. So Preston quotes as a paper from way, way back, which was in relation to something else. He uses the, ex the expression the tyranny of structurelessness, which is a very famous paper in anthropology used to describe a political movement. And he argues the problem with Ethereum, the problem with Blick block with Bitcoin. Is it, it's attached to this idea of not having a structure, not having an organization. And that in many real world instances, you need a structure, you need uh, the blockchain to be administered somehow. You have to have, otherwise you just end up with a mess. So their argument is that sometimes you need a private network, sometimes you need a private blockchain, sometimes you need a public. So the Eris business model 
runs, and I had Preston in my office, interviewed him with a Barclays guy sitting there, Barclays are buying into it. So it was, it was fascinating just that, and I played the stupid because it wasn't difficult, because I am when it comes to this stuff. So I said, okay, tell me how this actually works. What's your business model? Eris is open source, as is Ethan Wheeler. How are Eris going to make money? Eris has got capital funding, it got quite a lot, and they have spent about 20% of it so far. They're, they claim they're already launched, they're running, they're already issuing software. Main customers, banks, and defense organizations, defense companies. Their business model is that the software is free, but they will charge a consultancy fee when people need help setting it up, advising, and so forth. Preston last night, I can send you this link, but if you go to my Twitter, you'll see it. Preston sent me a, a link yesterday to uh, just a few slides that he'd issued of a real-time gross payment, how to set one up. And the argument he has is um, that you can set up a, a huge clearing system for 10,000 transactors, like in a debt system, in five minutes using various software. It's there, it's running, it already exists. So their argument is that they're selling utility, they're selling something which is useful for some things and not for others. He resists, he knows a libertarian, a Preston, and he's, they resist all ideas that the blockchain answers political problems, that it has a sort of social application. They say yes it can be used for the bank, yes it can be used by bank corporations, yes it can be used. They're agnostic about where it's used. So I said, hang on, you're getting involved in defense corporations. You know, I hate you for this. They were like, we don't give a monkey. We don't care who we sell this to. It's technology. So there are lots of problems with it. So that's the key difference. Uh, Ethereum still has this idealistic uh, attachment, I think. But I have to say, I wasn't terribly persuaded by it. By, and I, I'm, this is on the thing, isn't it? So uh, ignore me. But I wasn't all that persuaded by the Ethereum presentation, I have to say, because it just seemed to me to be, first, the magic reference was problematic for me. You know, I don't like being told that something's magic. It's, that's, that's just rubbish. Um, but also, the, 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 the sense of, you know, I've been unable to somehow compromise what I really. On the other side, you know, I'm not all that comfortable with what Eric's is saying, given that they seem to be just saying, I don't know, just, you know, it can be used for anything. But I like the Eris attempt to demystify the blockchain, to say it's just software, it's just the database, it's nothing more than that, it's not going to answer. Um, I find that interesting. Um, and it's, if, if you're really interested in the kind of theoretical arguments around this, it's worth going down Preston Burns' Twitter, because he was spending, he spent a lot of time until about a month ago effectively trolling Bitcoin. So one of the ways of marketing it was to effectively get involved in every Bitcoin debate and expose what he thinks is the you know, ridiculous ideology underlying it. So areas that are opposed to Bitcoin, and of course they love all the problems that the Bitcoin Foundation is having, uh, and so is Ethereum. But Vitaly admitted that he has 32 of his networks in Bitcoin, so they're still heavily invested. And just by and by, there is about $800 million of pension capital tied up in, in Bitcoin, so it's not going to go away anytime soon, I think. But the debate between these camps is, is absolutely <coughs> fierce. Now, Bitcoiners are, are very fierce in defending their own, which is testified to their own. But that's, that's how I see it going. Does that help? Does that help? <coughs> yeah, it's, it's really fascinating. And I'm not a techie. So I have to have this stuff explained to me in really mm -hmm. simple terms. But it isn't magic. I know that for sure. One thing that Eric said like to Colonis, the Republic of Colonis, the literal only sense of the blockchain, yeah. Ethereum you need to use Eris. There is no all Ethereum, there's no magic. They're not making these new scripting version of Ethereum. You have to use Eris. There's you can create your own. So they're saying roll your own blockchain in a few minutes. The history is fascinating because I, I had, I mean, but I, I had a Barclays guy and Preston in my office, and I wanted to get the genealogy of it. So I was asking where did, and, and the Eris guys were involved with Ethereum initially, and the code. Yeah, it's, it's built on, it's the code. It's built on here. Yeah, except now it's forked away, and there's a bit of a bit of tension. 
Um, but it's interesting because you think, well, what Eris are doing now seems obvious. Uh, it seems like the obvious thing to do. But there was a kind of eureka moment where they were sitting and they were just kind of almost scenario planning. I don't know what are we going to do with this. The idea of just splicing up the blockchain and, yeah. and making it something which could be used for. So these organizations are probably just trying to do this themselves anyway, behind some doors. Yeah. So, so sure. He's been, he's been, yeah. Uh, can I? Yeah, yeah, sure. Just yeah. interrupt. I mean, it's getting a bit late for the breakout sessions. I'm very happy if the, con the conversation continues in the sessions and also the plenary after that. Yeah, great. Okay. okay. Thank you very much.